Representation matters. But as indigenous Chicano people, we can't just sit back and wait for mainstream media outlets to make it happen for us. And nor should we. We started the Tales from Aztlantis podcast because we believe that it is imperative for Chicanos, Chicanas, and Chicanex people to produce our own media and tell our own stories. And the way we choose to do this is by using Buzzsprout to host the podcast. Buzzsprout is by far the easiest and best way to launch a professional podcast. You'll get a podcast website, audio players that you can drop into other websites, detailed analytics to see how people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and much more. To start your own podcast and get a $20 Amazon gift card, follow the link in the show notes. This lets Buzzsprout know that we sent you and helps support the show. Buzzsprout, the easiest way to start a podcast. Now, on with the show. You must excuse me. I've grown quite weary. This hasn't been easy, I know. But you've learned a lesson. A lesson in honesty. Honesty to yourself and honesty to others. That lesson will stand you in good stead all your life. I think we've all learned a good lesson. I've always heard that honesty is the best policy. Now I'm catching on to why that's so, why that's so, why that's so, why that's so. Why that's Greetings, so, why that's dear listeners, and welcome to yet another episode of Tales from Astlantis. We are your hosts, Curly Tlapoyawa. And Ruben Ariano Tlacateca. So how are you doing tonight, sir? I am doing fine. Why, thank you for asking. <laughs> Happy birthday, by the way. Hey, thanks. When is yours? June 13th, it's June coming 13. up. June 13th, all right, excellent. I need to mark it on my calendar. It's almost here, my friend. You gonna throw a big shindig? I know you've done some big ones in the past. We usually throw a very, very large birthday party, and we usually get at least 100 people, and the cops always show up to <laughs> shut us down. So we'll see. I don't know, I mean, with the with the pandemic and all, if I do it, it'll be way scaled down i don't know if we're gonna do it though haven't you heard pandemic's over yeah well it's fake it's a pandemic, bro <laughs> it's a scam demic so today we're going to be talking about some new mexican history and it's something that i enjoy bringing up on this show every once in a while being that my family has deep roots here in the state of new mexico and if you've lived here for any amount of time, you know that acequias, or ditches, most people just know them as ditches, right, are a big and vibrant part of New Mexican heritage uh, because they have a lot to do with how water is allocated, how water is resourced and distributed and used by acequia communities to grow their food. So acequias are, are life in uh, in many parts of New Mexico. What about the um, ditch witches? How do they relate <laughs> to this? La Llorona. She's yeah. We've got our own little our local version of La Llorona, the ditch witch, as the uh, the uh, white citizens of New Mexico <laughs> like to call her. <laughs> the ditch witch. The ditch That's witch. Funny. I actually haven't heard that in a while. That was a that was big when I was um like in high school, I think. Mm. They were really trying to push that, you know, beware of the ditch witch and we were like, You mean La Llorona? Like why are you trying to what are you doing? <laughs> I think they finally just gave up because I haven't seen it. It didn't in a while. catch on? <laughs> no, thank goodness. Well hopefully this episode will put that back on the map. <laughs> Fingers crossed, Acequias, a forgotten history. The Acequia is a communal irrigation ditch, and its continued use is a testament to the cultural resiliency of the New Mexican people. But where does this tradition come from? Sadly, 
most New Mexicans have a distorted understanding of acequia history and credit its creation solely to Moors and Spaniards. For example, a recent article in National Geographic frames the origins of New Mexican acequias as follows. This communal water system traces its roots to the Spanish conquistadors who brought their traditions to the territory in the 1600s and who themselves borrowed it from the Muslims who invaded Spain in the 8th century. Indeed, the word acequia, pronounced a se qui a stress on the sa, is an adaptation of the Arabic as sikaya, sakia, not sure, meaning water carrier. I think it's asakia, but I don't speak Arabic. But is this really true? Well, as Captain Kirk would say, but that's not the way it happened. In fact, there is way more to the story. You see, when the Spanish arrived in Mesoamerica in 1519, they encountered civilizations that were thousands of years old. These civilizations gave rise to exquisite works of art, philosophies, monolithic architecture, systems of government, schools, libraries, and of course, highly developed systems of agriculture. One of the hallmarks of Mesoamerican agriculture was a system of irrigation ditches and canals known as apantli, or apantle, depending on the variety of Nahuatl that you speak. The apantli formed a network of irrigation ditches that were fed by the Way apantli, or the Great Canal, which was used to distribute water to individual fields, or milpas. Now, I should mention that irrigation ditches were also in use at this time throughout the Americas. The Hohokam in Arizona built a vast system of irrigation ditches, and the ancestral Puebloans of New Mexico also had developed systems of water governance, for example. Some communities used the Apantli as part of their name, which was expressed visually in Mesoamerican text, by a drawing of the cross-section of an irrigation ditch along with a phonogrammic symbol. So basically you would get these communities that would name themselves, for example, from the Codex Mendoza, we have Awilisapan, uh, Totolapan, and Akokospan. And these are all from the Codex Mendoza. And the way that the name is written using the Mexica style is the cross-section of a ditch, and then you had the other symbols. So, for example, Awilisapan means uh, apantle happiness place, right? So it has like this guy sitting in an apantle holding his hands up, like really happy. Totolapan is like the bird apantle. So the symbol is of a bird sitting on an apantli. So the pan part of that word comes from pantli, which means banner. And so in in effect, they're making a metaphorical uh, analogy to uh, a banner that's kind of long. Yes, something straight. Straight. So the apantli, these irrigation networks, were straight and rigid. So apantli... Exactly like you said, they they had had this connection to Mm -hmm. something that was straight and rigid. Nice. Perhaps the best depiction of the vast network of Apantli that stretched across Mexico Tenochtitlan is the Uppsala map. In this map, we see just how deeply this agricultural technology was ingrained into the social fabric of a Mesoamerican city-state. And I'm going to put the Uppsala map in the show notes so that our listeners can see it for themselves. But basically, it's a map showing a section. Well, it's showing uh, Mexico Tenochtitlan. But then you can also see all of the various irrigation ditches that are running out of it and into it. Because remember, they had these massive canals, right, that were being brought into the city to bring in drinking water. So... The Apantli, the irrigation ditch, massive part of life in Mesoamerica. 
When the Spanish first saw the Apantli, they were reminded of the irrigation ditches they had seen used by the Moors, which they knew as Asequia. The rest, as they say, is history. The Spanish simply chose to refer to the Apantli with a term that was more familiar to them, and an ancient Mesoamerican technology was rebranded with an Arabic name. Don't believe me? Well, let's take a look at the entry for Apantli in Alonso de Molina's 1571 Nahuatl language dictionary. Apantli, Asequia de Agua. The importance of the Apantli in Mesoamerican agriculture is made abundantly clear in Book 6 of the Florentine Codex. This book, which contains the Huehuetlachtoli, or the ancient word, relates the moral philosophies which guided the lives of citizens of Mexico Tenochtitlan. For example, And especially take care of the ridge, of the ditch, plant and sow in the field. And, Perhaps thou wilt make well the ridges of land, the canals. So once again, these are all from Book 6 of the Florentine Codex. Later, the Spanish enlisted thousands of Nahuatl-speaking Tlaxcaltecas and Mexicas to colonize New Mexico. And they brought with them this Mesoamerican agricultural technology. The introduction of the Apantli system into New Mexico is discussed in the book Thinking Like a Watershed. Oñate knew that in order for the new settlement to thrive and survive, water was needed. According to Dr. Tomás Martínez Saldaña, agricultural historian from Mexico City, who has done a lot of work on the role of the Tlaxcalas in the settlement of the northern frontier of New Spain, it was the Tlaxcaltecas who were instrumental in helping lay out the acequia system in what is now New Mexico. To be fair, irrigation was also taking place in the southwest, as evidenced by the great canals uncovered near present-day Phoenix. And this is by Juan Esteban Arellano. You guys related? Not Maybe. that I know of, but perhaps hmm. distant Perhaps. Relations. As noted in the National Geographic article mentioned at the beginning of this episode, Asequia culture remains a vibrant and important aspect of New Mexican cultural identity. But sadly, its Mesoamerican origins remain largely ignored. Most historians simply repeat the myth told by National Geographic. The Asequia is purely an old world invention. Now, the point of this episode is not to say that Asequias are solely an invention of Mesoamerica, nor to discount the Moorish and Spanish contributions to Asequia governance. But there already exists a preponderance of information detailing that part of the history. I simply hope to make the Mesoamerican contributions to Asequia development more well known. If you scratch just beneath the surface, the Mesoamerican origins of New Mexico's Asequias become visible. For example, the term Apantle is still used by many in northern New Mexico to describe parts of the Asequia system. The term Tapanco, a small temporary dam used to divert streams of water, is also of Mesoamerican origin from the Nahuatl language. It comes from the Nahuatl word Tlapantli, which is a heap or a pile. But perhaps my favorite is the term Tequio a word in the Nahuatl language used to describe a traditional indigenous system of communal social organization and labor. Here in New Mexico, this word is used to describe the communal act of cleaning the acequias. So in northern New Mexico, where they say this, this weekend we're having a tequio, it literally means we're all, we all have to get together this weekend and we're all going to help each other clean out the acequia. And that's part of the ancient Castilian Spanish? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> you know, I'll bet you anything there's somebody that thinks that uh, tequio is a, like an ancient Castilian word. I swear, man. <laughs> 
However you choose to slice it, Acequia communities in New Mexico are as much an extension of Mesoamerican institutions as they are of Arabic and Spanish institutions. Most Chicanas and Chicanos with roots running deep in New Mexico descend from the Mesoamericans who helped settle this state. And if we take the time to look, we can see the imprint left by our, our indigenous ancestors all around us. It is in the food we eat, the language we use, the customs we practice, our connection to the land, and the agricultural heritage held dear by so many New Mexicans. It is in us. We only need to look. The magic was always in you, Curly. I knew it. <laughs> it wasn't a magic acequia at all. <laughs> you know what bugs me about this ar um, this article by the uh, National Geographic? Nat Geo. Yeah. Is that by them giving credit to the Moors via the Spanish, in a sense, aren't they also kind of adding a little bit of fuel to that whole black omic myth because isn't that one of the things that these people they latch on to these terms like more and and mm -hmm. and uh, what's the other one that's used to describe the pyramids um what was the word that the spanish oh used? Mosques. mosques they would say that the, the the temples were mosques and cues whatever cues are and these people don't understand that the reason why the spanish use those terms is because they had no frame of reference other than the Moors, whom they were already fighting back in Spain when they were reconquistando España, right? Mm -hmm. And so they used those very same terms that they were using to describe the Moors back in the old world to describe things that they were witnessing in the in the new world because they had no other yeah. way to describe yeah, it. Exactly. And that's even how they got the word acequia, right? Exactly. So they, they were familiar with the acequia system. So they saw the Mexicas and the Tlaxcaltecas and the Totonacos and everybody else that they were encountering using similar systems of irrigation and governance. And they were like, oh, these are just like the acequias that the Moors use. Mm -hmm. So we'll just call them acequias. Right. And even then they would call them the bows and arrows, right? They would call them Turkish bows and arrows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the temples they, they referred to as mosques. And if you were, you know, of a... A particular shade of, of skin color. They're like, oh, they're like a they're like a Turk. Mm -hmm. They're like a, a Moor, and so they used their frame of reference. And what these pseudo historians and pseudo scholars do, they push this distorted, bizarre racial fantasy that no, it these are referencing the Moors, you know, referring to like the the Black Moors. And, and claiming they were the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's like this weird distortion of history. And yeah, when National Geographic does stuff like this, it kind of feeds into that. There's that comic book. It's a web comic called Aztec Empire. Um, it's a really cool comic book. I'm a fan of it. But there's one section where Cortez, and I, I don't know if it's Cortez or if it's just like some random Spanish captain, But he's talking about an indigenous woman. And he's like, I'm going to have my way with this Moor, right? And to their credit, I reached out to the creators of this comic book. And I was like, you know, people are going to latch onto that. And they're going to distort it. And they're going to try to make it seem like the Spaniards were talking about, you know, the Moors. Like the Moors Moors. Mm -hmm. And that they, you know, that the real indigenous people are Moors. So the creators of the comic book actually, because it's a real, the thing I like about that comic book is it has citations mm -hmm. and end notes. And so they put a little citation number in that issue when he says that. And at the end in the end notes, it, it, it addresses that. And it says, this is, you know, they use the word more for the following reasons. And so I thought that was really cool. They didn't have to do that, but they, at least I got them to, to change that. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, and who from Nat Geo, like, they're not going to know any better, right? Because one of the problems with mainstream academia and archaeology and stuff is you tell people like, hey, there's this whole group of people out there <laughs> who think that the Moors, they call themselves Moors, they're African Americans, but they call themselves Moors and they claim that they are the real Native Americans. And so when you use these words, you know, they latch onto them and they distort them. But academics and, and historians, archaeologists look at that and they're like, what a bunch of idiots. 
you know, like that's nonsense, but they don't address it. They're like, well, this is nonsense. Why would we even give that the time of day right. to, to counter that? And since they're not countering that, what they're doing is they're creating this void that's being filled with pseudoscience and pseudo history and nonsensical bullshit. Well, because addressing these things isn't going to get them tenure, isn't going to advance their careers. Exactly, right? They so, don't, why, I they mean, don't care. you've got a finite amount of time to yeah. dedicate to your studies and, exactly. and your research. So, why would you? But luckily, we have guys like, you know, Ken Fetter um, and David Anderson, who are badass archaeologists, who make it their point <laughs> to, to counter. Uh, Have they written anything claims. on this? I'd like to read some of the whatever they've written. Well, Ken's book. I have his book. I don't book. know if he covers it. Let me see. The Frauds and Mysteries yeah, one? Yeah, I have, I have, I think, the third edition of that book. I have the seventh edition. Oh, there's a seventh edition? God. Well, there's uh, there's even a, a later one, too. Like He, he puts out one often because he's constantly updating it. Updating it. it. Okay. But what's great is I, I think he does... I know he references the whole Black Olmec myth. Do you know what chapter it's in? I'm I'm gonna be honest with you, man. I I do not. Okay. Yeah, because I I did see it in here. All right. Well, I guess I'll find it eventually. I, I mean, I've been trying to make my way through this book, but you know. The thing I like about it is it gives you these little critical thinking exercises at the end of each chapter. So, like for example, he has critical thinking exercise using the deductive approach outlined in chapter two. Oh, how here would you it is. Test these hypotheses. So chapter he, he six, you work. Africans in ancient America, Afrocentrism, Africans in ancient America, the verdict, page 110 on my edition. That's chapter six. Yeah. Chapter six after the Indians before Columbus. So good on him. Good on Ken for that. Yeah, for sure. I'm going to have to definitely read that part because we need to um, circle back to that topic because it's becoming problematic. Oh, absolutely. I'm actually writing up an episode. Uh, about it and it would be, be great to have somebody like Ken on the show too I've reached out to him before and he uh, said he's interested oh cool Ken if you're listening <laughs> please come on the show <laughs> <laughs> well speaking of Ken I just watched a, uh, a great documentary on Amazon called Science Friction have you heard of that one I have heard of it I haven't watched it yet it's uh, Dunning's Brian Dunning's documentary. It's good. Is it? Yeah, it's got uh, Ben Radford's in it. Um, good old Ben. Ken is in it. David Anderson is in it. And basically, the, it's about how shows like the History Channel will invite legitimate archaeologists and historians on to give their shows credibi- uh, this veneer of credibility, but then they just edit whatever they say. You know, to make it sound like they're they're backing up the narrative of the show. Any Chicanos on that show? No. And uh, Brian Dunning actually told me because he'd heard about this little little operation that I that I was involved with. Uh huh. And he was like, if he told me, if man, if you were still doing that, if we were still editing, I would have asked you to to participate. Hmm. Okay. Well, at least they're trying to reach out. So good. Yeah, maybe next next uh, next round. Well, speaking of which, this this uh, this thing that I'm in comes out tomorrow. Is it tomorrow? So, tomorrow night. Whoa! <laughs> and it's on the History Channel. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's on. It's on a channel. It's on a channel. And it, the name of the show, the name of the channel, is a mystery. It, it, it rhymes with mystery. You could say it's a mystery channel. Hmm. Okay. I'm just not sure what I'm allowed to say um, outside of the, the the bounds of the what I signed before the show comes out. Before. Right. But once the show is out, I can uh, well by the ta- talk about. By the time this episode airs, it's going to be after the show comes out. That's true. Yeah, that's right. So if you're listening to this, the show will have already come out a week before, like a week ago. Yep. Yeah. But I want to do it as its own episode. I want I want it to be. Uh, oh yeah, we're not going to talk about know. it today. No, no. We're, yeah, we're supposed I want it to be, to be its talking own about acequias. That's true. One of the things with acequias that's happening here in New Mexico that's really interesting is so the state of New Mexico just legalized weed. Legalize and, it. And I'm not against it, right? I think it's yeah, of course, weed should be legal. But but 
what's happened is all of these like right wing politicians had already positioned themselves to take advantage of the legalization of weed. So like you have all these former cops and shit that were jailing people for smoking weed just last year, but they were already investing in and getting because they saw the writing on the walls, right? They're like, weed's going to get legalized. We need to be in on, on the ground floor. And so now you've got this situation where the majority of money that's going to be made by the people setting up these companies, it's all going to be out of staters and it's all going to be like former cops and shit. (laughs) It's pretty whack. Damn. But the other big thing is it's actually going to harm, in my opinion. I mean, maybe it won't, you know, I, I we'll see. Time will tell. But I think that it's going to harm in a lot of ways traditional Asekia communities because this water has to come from somewhere for this weed. And New Mexico's in a drought, man. New Mexico's in a hardcore drought. And the Asekias themselves, I have friends in Asekia communities who are like, we're already hurting. Like there's already not enough water going around. I think what happened was everybody was so eager to, to legalize weed that maybe they didn't uh, think it through do like a big, big picture analysis mm-hmm. of how this was going to affect um, ultimately Chicano indigenous communities, mm-hmm. you know, in New Mexico or, or could get hurt by this. So we were hurt by it when it was illegal. And now we're going to be hurt by it. When, when, it's legal. when does it take effect? This new law? Oh, it's already it's already kicked in. Oh, it's already kicked it, in. Uh, yeah. The, uh, this month. So I think on the 1st, April 1st. Wow. Okay. So it's been 18 days. So have they commuted people's uh, sentences who were thrown in jail and prison? For- Honestly, I don't know, but I would hope that that's something that's retroactively under discussion, yeah, right? Go back like, and commute sentences and stuff. That, that should happen. Shit. How much would that suck if you're doing time right now for selling weed in a state that now legalizes legalize weed? Yeah. I'd be pissed. Yeah, I'd be pretty angry. So, yeah, that's an unfortunate consequence. So what exactly, I mean, so you have acequias, you have a, a traditional system of ditches that existed prior to the arrival of the Mexica and the Tlaxcaltecas, and then they bring in their version of it. Was it How different was it from, for example, the pre-existing Hohokam and the one that was brought in from central Mexico, like those irrigation systems? You know, that's a good question. I don't have a precise answer, but I would think just from what I've seen of the way that the Hohokam irrigation systems were set up, they were pretty similar. I mean, the general idea being you have your Asequia Madre, right? Or in Nahuatl, the way Apantli, same concept. So you had your primary Asequia that carried the water, and then you had individual Asequias coming off of it that were used by individuals or groups of individuals. Mm -hmm. So everybody was allotted their portion of water and it was all distributed equitably and everybody was responsible for maintaining the acequia. I think I remember seeing that, that what you're describing in action in that documentary from, I think it was the eighties called uh, Milagro Beanfield War. The groundbreaking documentary, ethnographic. Ethnographic. <laughs> <laughs> Did they have a Sekias in that movie? Uh, well, I haven't seen that movie in forever. Yeah, I would imagine well, they there's, would. There's a scene at the end where the bean field gets water from somewhere miraculously. I don't know how. That's right. Ah, that movie sucked. <laughs> Representing your state, man. Come on. You got to give it some props. <laughs> Growing up, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of frame of reference as to New Mexico culture, but that was one, you know, it's like, give me an idea what to expect whenever I, uh, if I Dad, went. Bless me ultima. Yeah, bless me ultima. Well, that wasn't a movie. It was a book. It became a movie eventually, what, like 10 years ago or something like that? Something like that with an all Puerto Rican cast. Is that what it I, You know, that's <laughs> weird, right? Like, <laughs> fucking hell, I swear. <laughs> But I'm not even going to get into that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you know what? To be in all honesty, it's been so long since I've seen Milagro being filled war that I should probably give it another shot. Like, check it out. The problem with, you know, and I'll, I'll just say, and I want this to be its own episode too sometime in the future. I would like to get some some Chicanos 
and Chicanas in working in the film industry on the show. But as as a Chicano who you who used to participate a lot in the film industry, I can tell you, man, those uh, those old Chicano movies, most of them, like eighty percent of them, are just fucking corny. Like <laughs> they're just corny, man. They're cheese ball. <laughs> All right, so you have the Milagro Beanfield War. What else? What else is, is corny? Uh, uh, mi Familia. That's like... Mi Familia. I guess, that's yeah, I that's guess. corny yeah. to the extreme. Yeah, man. I, I can see that. I can see that. Uh, yeah. And what else? I mean, there was like a whole slew of just, you know, Edward James almost involved movies that came out around that. How do I reach <laughs> these kids? <laughs> Fill the hole. <laughs> Hey, Finger Man. Finger Man. <laughs> you know what? He played a main character in two really good movies, though. So I got to give him that. Okay. And he was in Blade Runner. So that's right. Blade Runner. That's a classic. That's a badass movie. But he was in uh, The Ballad of Gregorio yeah. Cortez. Yep. That was which, also Luis Valdez's production, right? That was dope. And Zoot Suit. Zoot I Suit. Mean, that movie goes hard, man. It does. I love you that know, movie. The thing about Zoot Suit is it doesn't get the credit that it deserves for, for what it was at the time. It doesn't. You know, and there's there's a show that's going to go on Nameless, but it's a nationally syndicated so-called Latino show about Latino things. And a few years ago... <laughs> Latino things. Yeah. They <laughs> did an episode where they talked about, um, quote-unquote, Latin theater. And um, they focused on the East Coast, as usual. Um, it's because it's, you know, that's the focus of the show. It's like West Side Story, stuff like that. Yeah, and, and never once did Zoot Zoot get a name drop in that entire episode for being not only, quote-unquote, a Latino, right? If you want to categorize yeah. it as such, um, play that was actually exhibited in Broadway. I mean, it, did, it had a whole run in Broadway, right? Before it was made into a movie. And I'm thinking, seriously? Like, you're going to talk about all these other plays, and you're not even going to mention the one Chicano, yeah. you know. Well, the positives you know and negatives of that are, the po- the the negative is they left it out of right. the discussion right. entirely. They erased it. The positive is Chicanos didn't get associated with Latinos. Exactly. So that's, so, so that's, <laughs> so maybe, thank that's you? the silver lining of... <laughs> <laughs> I just remember watching that as a kid, uh, my mom being like so hyped that it that it was on VHS and like bringing it home because she had always told me the story because I'm from this bar- uh, this uh, barrio called Dog Patch in mm-hmm. Pueblo, Colorado, right? And she would always talk about this this guy that she went to high school with or was in like a class below her. Who was a dancer who was in Zoot Suit. Mm, okay. And, Interesting. And I don't know if he was like in the stage version or the movie or, or whatever. You know, I was young. I I didn't even know what Zoot Suit was. But she was so happy. She brought it home. She was stoked, man. And then we watched that. And it had an effect on me. Mm-hmm. Like I was like, I swole with like pride watching that movie. Right. As a kid, you know, like seeing all these Chicanos. And when he, uh, when the dad is like, you know, when you join the Navy, are you going to promise me you'll take that damn thing off and, you know, and throw it away? But he's like, it's Chicano style, dad. <laughs> and he's like, don't call yourself that. But I was like, haven't oh, I told you not no. to use that word? <laughs> yeah, I told you not to use that word. Or when almost is like, don't try to out Pachuco me, I said. <laughs> <laughs> I used to go around the house like saying that to my right. mom and everybody in the family. <laughs> Don't try to help but you go me. Yes, that's a badass movie. Well, I mean, it's interesting that that we kind of made our way to Zoot Suit in this episode of Asekia. The entire episode of the Zoot Suit and the story that it's based around the the, um, the Zoot Suit riots and the Sleepy Lagoon trial. Uh, you know, that's that's usually focused on, on California. California and Los Angeles wasn't the only place that had Zoot Zooters and riots. Just saying mm-hmm. that can be an episode at some point. Yeah, but um, sure. I mean, the Sleepy Lagoon. Now, think about this. Was that part of an Asequia system as well? The Sleepy Lagoon? I don't know. You know what? Um, 
It's interesting that you bring that up because I had just started to read an article about Sleepy Lagoon a couple of days ago. And I, I only got the abstract uh, read, so I have to finish the article. But it'll be interesting um, because I know they do reference like where where the lagoon was uh, located. Because it wasn't called Sleepy Lagoon. Like Sleepy Lagoon is the name that the Chicanos gave it. Yeah. And it's because they would go, oh, no, no, you know what it was? It was a dam because that's where they would go swim because uh, Mexicans weren't allowed uh, in the swimming pools. In the pools. swimming pools, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they would go swim at this dam and they called it Sleepy Lagoon because there was like a Pachuco song uh, that referenced Sleepy Lagoon somewhere. Mm -hmm. So all the Chicanos started calling it Sleepy Lagoon Sleepy after Lagoon. the song. Got it. Well, I mean, I bring that up because some years ago, this is going back quite a few years, actually, um, when I was doing some research for, I think, I don't know if it was my, maybe it was my dissertation. Um, I came across a reference to a creek or something similar to to a creek, maybe like a little, uh, like a ravine or something. But it was up in like, like in the Bay Area, just east of Oakland, somewhere in that area. And it was called Temescal or Temescales or something like that. And I've always been curious about where that name came from for that. I mean, because it's, I mean, that's very far up north, even for California, for something like that to have the name of Temescal associated mm -hmm. with some some natural, you know, body of water. And, and I don't know if maybe there might be a, a, some sort of connection with like an acequia system in that area. So I, didn't, I wasn't sure if maybe you had ever heard of that or... I wanted to no, run it by you. I've always wanted to ask you. It's never come up before. It's actually the first time that it's come up in conversation. And so I just wanted to run it by you, see what you thought about that. No, I haven't heard of it. That's that's something that we should look into. Okay. So what else can we say about these acequias? What are they good for? <laughs> well, when I lived down in Peralta, New Mexico, and you came and visited once, uh, my parents' house. I do remember that. There. Yeah. And so we had an acequia that ran right along the side of our house. And so I would have to go out there and open it up to get water because my mom would always grow. You know, like she had a, a big garden, right? So we would use the acequia. But we, we weren't allowed a whole lot of water. So we used... Because you're, you're like given portions of water mm. that you're allowed to use depending on the size of land that you have. And there's like all these rules and regulations and stuff. And there's even a, an elected individual called uh, the Mayordomo, who's like in charge of that specific acequia and setting up the tequios to have it cleaned and stuff. So it's like this very rigid system of governance. But yeah, during that period of, of my life, you know, that was like... That was cool, opening it up and seeing that water come gushing out and filling up our field. And then I'd go out there and I'd close it. And every year, you know, we'd go out there and, and have to help clean it. So that that was very cool, man. They're, it's just like, you know, when they say water is life, like people understand that, you know, you know, in the sense of like, well, yeah, obviously water is life. I got to drink water to live. But when you're like growing stuff and you're eating what you're growing, it takes on like this whole different, different meaning, you know? And then when you've got an entire community that's doing that and sustaining themselves off of it, then like, yeah, water is life. And here in New Mexico, we're, we've, we had just a, a week ago, we had like these three massive fires, um, I don't know if they're still even going. We had one in the Bosque down by Peralta where I used to live. We had one in southern New Mexico and one in uh, northern New Mexico. And it's so dry here. Like we're in the middle of a, of a really devastating drought. And through my job, I've worked most of the forests in New Mexico for like months at a time. And I would come back and I would always tell my wife like, these forests are tinder boxes. Hmm. Like there's just deadfall everywhere. And, you know, we were out there doing what's called a, a CFRP, which means a uh, collaborative uh, fuel reduction program. So people, different government agencies were collaborating and they were going to go in there and try to clear out 
all the deadfall. They don't, right? They don't try to Fuel do reduction. like controlled uh, fires to try to get rid of some so, of that. So that's part of it. But it was either they would do a, a, a controlled burn or they were going to open it up to allow people to go up and collect firewood. Mm -hmm. So, or like some big corporation was going to come in and log, right? So there were all of these different reasons for doing a CFRP. Our job was to go out there and make sure that no cultural resources were going to be destroyed as a result of these activities. So mm. we'd have to go out there and identify archaeological sites and then write up reports that the best way to preserve these sites, try to protect them. But I saw it firsthand, man. These places were, they're tinderboxes. And we're in the middle of this horrible drought. So acequias now more than ever are important in New Mexico. And now it's it's just going to be all about water. Like this, this state is hurting. What is the historical importance of the acequias to New Mexico? Well, I think it just comes down to you have these small communities, mainly in northern New Mexico, where a lot of these acequia communities uh, still exist. But even here in Albuquerque, there's acequia communities uh, within the city itself, right? In like the South Valley. Um, what's interesting is uh, one of them is uh, Atrisco, mm -hmm. which is Atlisco, which is a Nahuatl name. It was like one of the earliest settlements of New Mexico, colonial settlements, and it has a Nahuatl name. But so people, you know, every year they have these uh, a blessing of the waters. So like the communities will come out. There'll be danzantes there. There'll be matachines there. There's the church shows up, the Catholic priests, and there's like this ceremony to bless the waters that year. And um, it's on uh, the Saint, uh, I can't remember his name. Is it San Ignacio? I think so. But he's like the patron of, of ditches, basically. Okay. I had no idea there was a patron of ditches. So that yeah, and could've... what's cool is in Mexico City, you'll find images of him that have been repurposed into images of Tlaloc. What? Yeah. That's that's different. San Isidro. San Isidro. San Isidro. That's his name. So I'm trying to get at something here. You have the word at atlisco, which comes from atlisco. Then you have the word tequio, which, I mean, that's I think that's just the basic now what tequio, right? Community work. And yes, I, I mean, I get that. The Spanish adopted acequia for the way apantles. But I'm curious as to why, of all the words that they're going to uh, Im import from the old world to label something, they're going to go with that one, but everything else is going to be Nahuatl or, you know. It's, it's weird. And that's one thing Nahuatl. that I, I point out with the word tortilla, too. Like, the most common of our foods. All of our other foods retain like a Nahuatl name or an indigenous based name, except for the most ubiquitous right. form of our food has a Spanish name. Like that's, it trips me out. And the same thing with acequia, right? So like all of this part of the, uh, you know, the tapanco, the, the punk, apantle, yeah, right. the tequio, but the word itself is still Spanish or, or a Spanishized version of an Arabic word. Mm-hmm. So here I see, uh, I pulled up uh, Albuquerque Journal. Communities in New Mexico still follow centuries-old traditions that came from Spain. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> With ceremonial <laughs> blessings for the waterways that give life to crops. Yeah, because only s s the Spaniards had ceremonies for waterways that gave life to or crops. Or only the right? Spanish could think of making ditches for water. Yeah, right? How hard is that? <laughs> it's it's pretty basic. Um in the honor of the May 15th Feast of San Isidro, patron saint of laborers and farmers. So that's what he is. Laborers and farmers. Ah, so With he's the saint of singing, the singing, dancing, and a blessing of local acequias. So it's actually pretty cool to watch because, like I said, uh, you know, all these different groups come out. Pueblo people come out. Matachines, danzantes, and they all participate in this... Uh, this blessing of the acequias. But then, of course, you know, Albuquerque Journal story repeats the same bullshit. Spanish settlers who came to New Mexico 400 years ago 
brought the tradition of building irrigation waterways. <laughs> it's like, yeah, because nobody else thought of uh, irrigation. It's crazy. Water, how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the thing is, here in New Mexico, man, it's it's like an uphill battle to convince people that adobe already existed before the Spanish came. Wait, who that says, who says that it didn't? Here in New Mexico, that's what you're taught. You're taught Get here in New Mexico that the here. Spaniards brought the technology of adobe. Brought it from where, though? That they learned it from the Moors. From the Moors? The Moors didn't even make adobe. Did so, they? I mean... Yeah, yeah, no, they, they did. The, the ovens... Yeah, the Ornos, that's that's definitely from from uh But adobe from the is I mean adobe is an indigenous technology to the Americas. So what they brought and it's it's funny because it's if you parse it a certain way they might technically be right because what the Spaniards brought was the use of hay to add. So they just to the adobe. They added they brought they, So they added an, an, an ingredient, ingredient and now it. they're credited with inventing the oh. entire but go to Pakime in Chihuahua. Shit, go to my dad's hometown. I mean, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> all the houses, at least the old ones that still exist, are all made of adobe. I used to watch people make adobe in my dad's hometown. Like, I've seen it done. And I even participated in, like, the making of it, you know, when I was a little kid. Yeah, I've made some adobe. I'm not any good at it. <laughs> and let me tell you, it wasn't some Spanish thing. I mean, it's definitely indigenous. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you look at just Paquimé, like I said, it's, you have an entire city that's built of adobe. Right. You know, but but they want to ignore all of that yeah. to credit that. And you know why? Because for the most part, mainstream Hispanophile New Mexicans are afraid of the truth. And you know what I say about the truth. Mm, something about medicine, right? Yeah. The truth is like medicine, my brother. Doesn't always taste good. Sometimes it <laughs> tastes funky, and sometimes it don't. But it's always good for you. Timo Itase. Thank you for listening to Tales from Aslantis. Please check out our website and consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Tlaskamati. Booyah.
Thank you for listening to Tales from Atlantis, a project of the Chimali Institute of Mesoamerican Arts. If you enjoy the show, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. You can do this by visiting talesfromastlantis.com and clicking support the podcast. Your continued support will help keep the podcast ad-free and independent. Until next time, Timoitase. <laughs>